Hello, Amherst Media. I understand you needed to do a sound check. Maybe Mr. Marshall, you could say something too. Certainly. This is a test. This is not the beginning of our planning board meeting. Anything else you want me to say, Pam? No, but I, I think I would suggest maybe that um, Chris Brestrup also say a little something so they can hear your voice. Hello, a little something. Okay, I think we can go ahead and get, get started. So Amherst, Amherst Media is good? Yeah, from All what right. I can see. Mm -hmm. All right, and we're off. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of December 1st, 2021. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.32 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media and minutes are being taken. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the, on the meeting agenda, posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll, roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself and answer affirmatively and then place yourselves back on mute. Maria Chow. Present. Jack Jemsek. Here. Tom Long. Present. Andrew McDougall. Present. Uh, I, we know that a Janet McGowan uh, has told us she will not be able to make it this evening due to illness. And Johannes Newman. Present. And I, Doug Marshall, am present. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak after speaking. Remember to mute yourself. The general public comment period is reserved for public comment regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment can also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate. Please indicate if you wish to comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. All right, so we're gonna go right into the items on the agenda. Uh, the first item is approval of meeting minutes for previous meetings. Uh, Pam or Chris, do we have any minutes for approval this evening? We do not have minutes for approval this evening. We will have several minutes next time. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I do hope you will let us know if we're getting, if we're falling behind 
Um, and in fact, it might be useful to uh, get a list of what the minutes are that are outstanding uh, after next week's or next the next meeting. Um, yes, that. So that we know where we stand at the end of the year. All right, the second item, item on the agenda is the public comment period. So at this time, uh, the public is invited to speak about items not on the agenda. So the items on the agenda concern 1113 East Pleasant Street, uh, Archipelago's request for a uh, preliminary subdivision plan, uh, the Article 16 proposal for a temporary moratorium on the solar array, and um, I think we had a third item. Um, yeah, approval of signage at 534 Main Street. So if you have comments about any of those three items, please do not comment at this time. But otherwise, you are invited to comment. And um, uh, I see there are 15 attendees in the, in the audience this evening. Uh, do any of you want to make a public comment about something not on the agenda this, at this time? Okay, well, maybe, maybe uh, we'll get some comments on the agenda when that comes up. So we'll, uh, the time is 637 and we will end the public comment period. Uh, I see the preliminary subdivision plan was advertised for 635 and so it's 637. Uh, Chris, would you like to introduce that or, or make any sort of statement? Yes, thank you. Um Kyle Wilson submitted a preliminary subdivision plan on behalf of Archipelago Investments. Um, he submitted it on July 12th. Um, and this was a, an effort to freeze the zoning on the properties at 11 and 13 East Pleasant Street, uh, pending any kind of um, zoning changes that would affect that property. Um, uh, since then, uh, Mr. Wilson has agreed to uh, abide by the inclusionary zoning bylaw that was passed um, earlier this summer. Um, and the item that's still pending that might affect his property would be the mixed use building bylaw. And we expect that the town council will vote on the proposed mixed use building zoning amendment at their meeting on December 6th. So Mr. Wilson is requesting that the public hearing for his project for his preliminary subdivision plan be extended to December 15th, which is um, the next planning board meeting after December 6th. Um, he's already uh, had, had the meeting um, continued a, a number of times, as you can see on your agenda, but he's asking for this one more extension um, to, see if, um, to see what happens with the mixed use building zoning bylaw. So you have a letter in your packet um, requesting this extension and let me know if you Chris, Chris, you just muted yourself. We didn't hear the last couple of words you said. Let me know if you have any questions about this and I'd be happy right. to answer them. So um, I, remind me, did, do we need to vote on this or do you simply need to know if there's any objections? You need to vote on this. Okay, all right. So um, board members, is there any discussion about this? Andrew. Oh, actually, Johanna was first. You wanna go, Johanna? You got your camouflage hand up again. I know. Oh yeah, okay. And, and you gotta change the color of your walls or the color of your hand. Exactly, <laughs> or there we go. Um, put it on my window. Um, yeah, is it okay if I go ahead, Doug? Sure. Um, you know, this has been delayed a number of times at this point, but I'm trying to remember, and I don't know it offhand, and Chris, I don't know if you do, but, you know, what's currently being proposed for the mixed use buildings is at least 30% non-residential as a standard. And I can't remember where 11 East Pleasant comes in and whether it would be in like whether it would jive with the new bylaw if passed or not. Do you remember it offhand? Uh, Chris, why don't, why don't you yes. reply? So I haven't done the calculations, but just based on 
kind of looking at the proposal and uh, making a kind of eyeball assessment, I think it may um, may comply with 30%, but I'm not sure about that. So um, Mr. Um, Wilson would need to submit um, information to the building commissioner to show how he complies with the bylaw if it is passed at 30%. I think if it's passed at anything more than 30%, it may not uh, comply, but then again, he might be able to change his proposal to have it comply. So, um, you know, either the, he will comply or if he doesn't comply, he has his preliminary subdivision plan or on the alternative, he could um, change his plan to comply. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chris. Andrew, you're up. Okay, I may need a sec to think through this, but I was just gonna ask Chris if, if you could in your own thoughts, sort of articulate the pros and cons, well, not the pros, but the, um, uh, the implications of, of a yes versus a no vote um, tonight. Chris? Um, so if you vote no, then um, I think you're essentially needing to deny um, the response to the preliminary subdivision plan because he won't have an opportunity to make a presentation to you about the preliminary subdivision plan. So you would be more or less denying approval of that. Um, I'm not sure that that you know, has a final implication and Rob Mora is here in the attendees and he may be able to answer this more completely because he's had experience with this before. But um, I believe that the requirement is that um, you submit a preliminary subdivision plan and then presumably the planning board would hold a public hearing. In this case, it hasn't. Um, and then within seven months, you need to submit a definitive subdivision plan if you want to maintain your, um, your freeze on the zoning. So that would mean, I think, by January 12th, if that's right, let's see, August, September, October, November, December, January. Um, no, it would actually be February. February 12th, he would need to submit a definitive subdivision plan um, because that's seven months after his first submittal, which would be which was July 12th. So um, I don't feel like a no vote is fatal, but perhaps Rob Mara has a different take on this and you may want to call on him. Um, Pam, do you mind moving Rob in or letting him speak? or at least making it so he can speak if he wants to. I just asked him to come to panelist. Okay. Hey, Rob. Hi, uh, thank you. So yeah, um, I, I agree with Chris and I would also probably suggest that, um, you know, it's really difficult to reject a preliminary subdivision plan, uh, the grounds on, on doing that, um, you know, I, it, it almost becomes routine, these requests for extensions, and it would have been nice for the applicant to be here just in case, but my, my thought is that if you were not interested in granting the extension, you'd have to be prepared to start the, here, the meeting on the preliminary subdivision review and start making comments and suggestions. You can do that without the applicant. We have the materials, um, but obviously kind of you know inefficient and awkward. Uh, so it would have been better if we, um, you know, maybe gave the applicant uh, an idea that maybe they wouldn't be granted this extension and should be here. And I don't know if we did that. All right. I'm seeing Chris uh, wag her head that we did not do that. So, so if I just, Jim, may I, Doug, could just finish my yeah, thought? Yeah, go ahead, Rob. Sorry. Yeah, it was, all right. So if we said, if we were to say no, there is, we're essentially putting them on the clock to have that. Like, could we then have a public hearing at the next meeting or? Well, it sounds like we need to, we need to allow a continuation this evening, but we could, uh, we could say we're not gonna, we're only gonna extend it to the next meeting. And, you know, a next meeting is the last extension. So the applicant needs to show up ready to have a hearing. Um, I. Chris, I don't believe we advertised a hearing 
for this topic this evening, right? Well, we did a, uh, advertise a hearing for October, or excuse me, for August 25th. And then subsequent to that, um, you know, whoever came to that hearing would know that the hearing was continued to a date certain and then would right. presumably tune in for each subsequent date. So and we've so, so we've met the advertisement requirement. Have, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Jack. Yeah, I'm just <clears throat> again. I I fun, uh, I sent you know, like a, a funny a video to about Zoom meetings <laughs> to some some of you. I don't know if you got it, but I'm just thinking like this is kind of like very odd that we have a hearing without the project proponent here and it's just it's just a non-starter for me and um if you want to continue the hearing uh that's fine but i just i don't understand the no-shows it's like we're we're arguing for them or against them without their input it's just it doesn't make sense to me well we haven't really started any hearing because we haven't we haven't had a presentation on any of the material. We haven't had any public comment. We haven't deliberated at all. Um, but it's know, on the agenda, you know, and yeah. I just, I, I just, um, I'm a little disappointed. Um, we're wasting our time without the, you know, the project proponent being here, so. Okay, thank you, Jack. Chris? Well, we do notify the project proponent and we send him an agenda whenever this is on the agenda. So he has an opportunity to come if he wishes to come. So it's been his choice not to come and to leave it up to staff to um, present his case. So I guess that's all I have to say. Okay. All right, well, I guess one way or the other, we need to vote on this this evening. Uh, is there any public comment on this topic? I do not see any. All right, therefore, why don't we go through a roll call on, on continuing this hearing for another two weeks to December 15th. Do we need a time on that, Chris? Um, <coughs> do, probably, let's see, Pam, are you, I should have thought about this in advance. Do you know the name, um, the times of the things that are on the agenda for that night? I think there's John Robleski with he is also filing a preliminary subdivision plan, but I don't know if we have timing for anything else. Do we, Pam? I don't believe so, Chris. Um, so John I'm Robleski is probably 635. 35. So you could say that this one would be 645 again, if you chose to do that or seven, okay. something like that. All right, does anybody want to make a motion for this? I see Andrew's hand up. Yeah, I, I was going to ask if you were making the motion, but I will make the motion to extend this to the 14 days to the next meeting at the time. I forgot the time we just said. I think it was 645. OK, thank you, Andrew. Um, a second. The invisible hand, Johanna. I second. <laughs> OK, thank you. All right, we'll go through the roll call. Maria. Approve. Jack. Approve. Tom. Aye. Andrew. Approve. Johanna. Approve. And I'm an approve as well. All right. So that's that's item three on the agenda for this evening. Uh, the time is 6:49, and we'll move to item number four, zoning bylaw for Article 16. All right, so in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 40A, this public hearing of the Amherst Planning Board has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to the Massachusetts Department of Housing and Community Development, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and abutting towns. This hearing is being held for the purpose of providing an opportunity for interest citizens to be heard regarding the proposed zoning bylaw. 
the, and the zoning bylaw concerns Article 16 and is entitled Temporary Moratorium on the Permitting and Approval of Large Scale Ground Mounted Solar Volt Photovoltaic Installations to see if the town will vote to add Article 16, Temporary Moratorium on the Permitting and Approval of any newly proposed large scale ground mounted solar, solar photovoltaic installations with a rated capacity of 250 kilowatts direct current or greater to be in effect until May 2023 or the date on which the town adopts amendments to the zoning bylaw concerning large scale ground mounted solar photovoltaic installations, whichever occurs earlier. During the moratorium period, the town under the direction of the town manager shall undertake a planning process to study, review, analyze, and address revisions to the zoning bylaw relative to large scale ground mounted photovoltaic installations. All right, do we have any board member disclosures? I see no hands raised. All right, so uh, with us this evening, we have town councilors Lynn Griesmer and Patricia DeAngelis. They, uh, I believe, are the proponents for this, uh, this amendment. And uh, would you guys like to make your presentation? Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for, uh, to the planning board for scheduling this hearing in a timely manner during a busy time of the year. A little strange. I feel like turnabout's fair play. Um, so we're here tonight. Um, let's begin by very clearly stating this proposed temporary moratorium is not about stopping solar. It is about being smart about how we proceed. Um, District 2 counselors, myself and Pat DeAngelis, initially became aware of the issues leading to this pr proposed temporary moratorium on permitting and approval of large scale ground mounted solar photovoltaic installations. When a few of our constituents con contacted us to talk about their concerns regarding a proposed solar project off of Shootsbury Road that would involve clear cutting of several many acres of forest. Those neighbors, like a growing number of other residents, are members of Smart Solar Amherst. In the process, we learned that unlike Amherst, surrounding communities, Pelham, Shootsbury, Sunderland, and Belchertown, as well as other communities in Massachusetts, have taken the time to create and pass specific solar bylaws. With what has taken Amherst so long, you know, nobody brought it up before and our existing bylaws so far have been sufficient. However, as we have learned over the past three years of this council and of this planning board, creating and passing a zoning bylaw is not fast nor easy. It includes research, drafting, revising, consultation with you, the planning board, consultation with other town committees, more revising, presentation to the town council and a vote to refer back to the planning board and CRC for hearings. Planning board and CRC then hold those hearings and develop reports, all of that within a given time frame. The bylaw is then reviewed by GOL of the standing committee of the town council, which includes a request for legal review and potentially reconciling and revising the bylaw with their recommendations. Finally, it comes back to the town council for two readings on, upon second reading a vote. Therefore, we are proposing this moratorium bylaw to allow the town of Amherst to take the time to develop a specific solar bylaw consistent with our community's values. It in no way suggests that we stop building solar and instituting other sustainability efforts. And it is not a moratorium that will prevent rooftop solar, parking lot solar, or residential solar installations, or any other creative ways that we can do them. With that, I yield to Pat DeAngelis. Thank you. Um, and thank the board for um, allowing us to be here. I know it's extra work for you. Um, our community deeply cares about sustainability and climate mitigation. 
we've adopted the state's energy stretch code passed a zero energy bylaw um, on, um, became a green community in 2012 joined the new england municipal sustainability network and in 2019 formed the energy and climate action committee in 2020 at the request of the town niche engineering did a high level gis analysis to identify suitable and unsuitable areas for solar siting within the town for um, solar farms, looking also at canopies on parking lots and solar installations on roofs of either municipal or affordable housing buildings. In 2021, the Climate Act, uh, Action Adaption, Adaptation sorry, and Resilience Plan thoughtfully created by ECAC encouraged responsible local solar development asking us to directly adopt a targeted townwide solar zoning bylaw that guides development to favorable locations and balances ecological, economic, social, cultural, and other values of the community's abundant natural lands with the need for renewable energy. Now, as we near the end of 2021, it is clear that we need to create a bylaw to facilitate and appropriately regulate the creation of ground mounted solar inst installations by providing standards for approval, place placement, design, construction, operation, monitoring, modification, and removal of such installations. Guidelines that focus us on public health, safety, environmental impacts, and other uh, impacts. Without the strong and explicit guidelines for site selection and design criteria, there have been and will continue to be a series of environmental failures and safety issues like those experienced in Orange, Ware, West Brookfield, and Williamsburg, Mass, where significant erosion and sediment transport altered protected wetlands affected adjacent properties, and in Williamsburg affected the West Branch Mill River. We, we can do better we, by giving ourselves the time we need to create re regulations that will provide us with the electricity we need and the ecological benefits that we, we require <laughs> to live healthy, balanced lives. I'm sorry, I'm stumbling over my words this evening. Um, I think Lynn and I are available for your questions. All right. Thank you, Lynn and Patricia. And Patsy. I'm sorry. Um, I let's see. I guess I, I'm I'm wondering if we're going to have extensive uh, public comment this evening, mm -hmm. and so partly because one of our members is absent, and partly because I think this is likely to be continued anyway. Um, I'm thinking that perhaps we should solicit public comment up front, and maybe have a very brief board conversation following that, and then um, continue the hearing to the next meeting where we can have a more full uh, deliberation. So uh, Jack, I see your hand up. Uh, did you want to start the deliberation or did you have another comment? Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just saying, I, I'm, you know, I, I have, done you know a fair amount of consulting on on solar fields and um the environmental impact thing i think is, is a little bit of a um stretch for these things uh i've seen um you know you know arguments that they're you know again if they're properly managed obviously the ones that that pat you know mentioned we're not monitored and you definitely need, you know, any construction project needs to be monitored. So I'm, I and, get the feeling you want to start the deliberation. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, yeah, I think that's what we do. Right. I mean, <laughs> right. So I'm sorry. I, I, I guess I'm, I'm thinking, why don't we solicit the public comment that's here this evening on this okay. topic and then we can have a, a, a bit of a conversation after that. We do have a couple of things after this. And I guess I was anticipating that we'd have a pretty large number of public comments. So I wanted to try to get through those, um, you know, and let everybody say their piece before it gets too late. So thanks for holding, holding for, 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 for the public comment. 
All right, so I do I do want to go to public comment at this time, and uh, I see uh, Pam's brought up the timer for three minutes, and I see three hands for public comment uh, thus far at least. So we'll call on them, and if, you know if, and then we'll see how how long that takes. So first up is Steve Roof. Uh, Pam, if you can bring him over to speak, and uh, if you would unmute yourself, give your name and your address. Uh, thank you, good evening. My name is Steve Roof. I live at 1680 Southeast Street, South Amherst, and I'm providing only my personal opinions uh, tonight. Uh, on the niche study that was mentioned by Pat, that only considered town lands, that did not evaluate private lands. Um, for the proposed uh, moratorium, I have two concerns and then one suggestion. First, I think the language in both the memo and in the, um, the, the proposed bylaw itself are unnecessarily pejorative. It considers solar as a nuisance that must be regulated. Um, it mentions none of the benefits of solar that are critical. Um, second, the memo uh, and the proposed bylaw do not at all recognize the need for solar based on our commitments for greenhouse gas reductions, both commitments that Amherst has made and also the legal requirements that Massachusetts has adopted for carbon neutrality. So I think the solar bylaw proposal should include both the benefits of the of solar to town and not just focus on the negatives and also needs to be consistent with our commitments for greenhouse gas reductions. And so my suggestion is we've been, folks have been talking about doing a solar study and that was part of the climate action plan. And I think that solar resource assessment needs to be completed before a bylaw is crafted, um, not the moratorium, but the bylaw itself. That really needs to be informed by a solar assessment that answers a series of questions about what sort of lands are available. It has to recognize the importance and um, critical need for ground mount solar to meet our climate action goals. It needs to have some provisions to guide solar development into favorable locations, including some incentives, which could be expedited review and permitting process for those preferred locations. And I think it needs to also examine those lands that are currently restricted from solar development by the SMART program, those lands, those parcels that might include core habitat or biohabitats, um, needs to address whether we may need to use some of those lands to meet our need for clean energy and climate commitments um, by the year 2050. So I would encourage you to perhaps revise the memo to um, be less negative about solar and then to hold off on drafting a bylaw until the solar study, a solar resource assessment study can be begun and completed. So thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Um, next, next we'll have Anna Devlin Gautier. Hope I pronounced that right. Would you please uh, give us your name, your address and give us your comments. Great thing. So it's Anna Devlin Gothier. Hi, everybody. This is the first time I've gotten to talk to planning board. I'm so excited. Um, I am I am a resident of District 5, South Amherst, Bay Road, and I'm here to make public comment encouraging you to support the proposed solar moratorium. I am also speaking on behalf of myself as a resident and not as a representative of any committee I might sit on. When the moratorium was presented to the council the first time, a number of councilors raised concerns, and I want to address those here because I have yet to hear concerns you may have, so I will follow up on those, I promise, but here's what I've got so far. The first concern folks had was that a moratorium was reactionary and that we should not, on principle, engage in reactionary policymaking. Yes, we should have had a solar bylaw years ago. It is shocking to me that we did not, but the reality is that we didn't, so here we are. The most important part of this moratorium is the impact on any potential projects which have yet to be proposed. This moratorium is no longer really a reaction to one particular project, but more to what that project uncovered, which is a potentially detrimental gap in our policy. Unfortunately, right now, being reactionary is necessary because we were not proactive. 
I encourage you to consider the impact of a moratorium, which primarily allows us to hold future solar installations accountable to a bylaw which would be designed to protect our natural resources while supporting the immense and immediate need for renewable energy sources in Amherst. Another concern was raised that we had other solar pro projects go in without a bylaw, so why now? Why bother with it now? This re kind of is the same as the reactionary comment, right? And the response is similar. Yes, we should have had a bylaw in place for those projects. We didn't. That does not take away from the need to have one now. Yet another concern generally opposed the concept of a moratorium. This moratorium is different from the ones that I have seen proposed in the past year or two. Uh, solar bylaws have become commonplace ac across the Commonwealth because they are imperative with the future of zoning and energy policy. Other cities and towns have been caught in the same position Amherst is in. They have utilized moratoria in similar ways, and all of those have been supported by the Attorney General as well. Their limited term, that's a very important key part of this, it's 18 months or less, right? This is not a case of we aren't done changing policy. This is a matter of a clear gap in our policy, which is providing a very large loophole for folks who might take advantage of it. Given existing support for the creation of these projects on the state and federal level, we know they will continue to be proposed. They should continue to be proposed, but they could slide through this major gap in our policy unless the moratorium allows us to create a bylaw prior to those proposals being submitted. The last thing I just wanna address quickly, I know I'm, I gotta go fast, sorry. Uh, another comment was made that we should trust the Conservation Commission and the Planning Board. And again, if either of us, sorry, I'm speaking as behalf of a resident, as a resident, not on behalf of a board. If either of those groups had bylaws which addressed this, then yes, that would be true. But right now, neither the Conservation Commission nor the Planning Board have a solar bylaw in front of them that they, were a, that they are able to reference in order to set monitoring requirements, in order to set installation requirements. We have nothing, we have no policy for these large scale installations. A key part of the creation of this bylaw is that siting study, a resource study. We need an understanding of what is available to us in Amherst with regards to solar. We know there aren't enough rooftops and parking lots to meet the energy needs of our town. Yes, we will most likely, I'm almost right. done, put large scale solar on agricultural or currently forested land, but without a study and without a regulation, we are flying blind and this is too big a plane to fly blind. Please think strategically, please support it. Thank you. All right, thank you, Anna. Next, we have Michael De, De Chiara. Thank you. Um, so my name is Michael De Chiara, and um, I too am speaking as an individual. I'm a member of the planning board in Shutesbury, so an adjoining town. So, you are, I, so your address is not in uh, Amherst? That is correct. It's 56 Thank Back you. Corner Road in Shutesbury. Um, I don't want to inter interfere with Amherst politics since I'm not a resident, but I did want to share an observation or two being on the planning board in Shutesbury. Um, we passed our solar bylaw in 2015-16 and subsequently amended it twice. Um, and so I use that as an example to say that there was a lot of thought and revision in developing our bylaw. Um, PVPC has cited it as one of the best practices in terms of a model bylaw in their um, solar guide. So it, it is something that's being held up. Doing this right for each community, there's 351 towns and cities, everyone's gonna have a different set of values and approaches. And I would say this is complex. So buying yourself some time to actually um, do it, you know, in addition to what Lynn said about, you know, all the procedural steps, just being thoughtful and making sure that it's appropriate for what, you know, the town of Amherst wants to see will take some time and thoughtfulness. So having a moratorium in place to buy the time to do that makes sense. Um, the other two things I would say, I just recently reviewed all available zoning bylaws for the 351 towns and cities, which is a little crazy. Um, but 206 have mentioned specifically of um, solar, large scale solar in their bylaws. And recently in the last few years, at least three towns have put in moratoriums of about 18 months so that they can actually develop them. So this is not something that is un untested ground. Um, it's actually, Everest and surprisingly is behind the curve on this, but you know, I guess I would just say it's, it's worth buying the time to do it right. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you, Michael. Next we have Laura Drauker.
Did we lose Laura? I think Pam? we lost. I think we we lost Laura. I gave her permission to speak, and um, she. Oh, right, there she is. She's there. Back. She is. Okay, hold on. Why don't we try it again? Hi, Laura. Can you unmute yourself? There you go. Yes. Yeah, sorry, the little box didn't come up last time. I don't know why. Um, okay. Right. Hi, everyone. Laura Drocker. I live in 57 Rosemary Lane in District 2. Um, I'm also speaking for myself and not any committee I may be on. Um, I want to echo, um, first, I want to say I am in, in generally in support of this moratorium. I do think we need a strong, smart bylaw that's based that helps drive us towards responsible solar development um, in line with the goals both Massachusetts and Amherst has to meet, to increase renewable energy and meet our climate goals. Um, I am a little concerned by the length of time, but I will heed to the recommendations that that's how much time it needs. Um, I will say I would really appreciate a clear process timeline for how the, by, the bylaw will be developed, where the inputs will be, and how that can be developed, hopefully somewhat in parallel, but ultimately after the a solar resource study is done, because we have to be able to, it, we're going to have to develop some, some forested land and some agricultural land to meet our needs. This is, this is, this is pretty clear. And so, and we need to do that right. And that's why we need a bylaw. But what we don't want the bylaw to do is be a nice to have, and then ultimately reduce the amount of land that we can use so much that we need to update the bylaw in two years to be able to meet our goals. So I really think the solar resource study is gonna really help us understand how much we can actually put on rooftops and parking lots and how much land we need to use. And then we can actually think smart about where we want that land to be developed and try to think, feel, think equitably about where that land should be developed. In addition to all of the important environmental issue, you know, considerations that need to be included in the bylaw. Um, I would second Steve's point earlier that I, I feel like why I appreciate both Lynn and Pat's um, opening statements in this meeting. I agree that the more the language within the moratorium memo and bylaw don't do not highlight the climate goals of the town or the need for solar. And I do think it would be helpful to put that in writing. Um, I also just want to to note that it, that the a bylaw alone is not going to solve our problems. I think Shootsbury has a great bylaw. I think they're having a lot of there's there's a lot of debate still about solar being developed there. So what can the town of Amherst do and ECAC potentially and other groups within Amherst to help bring our community along together during this hopefully less than 18 month process so that when we're ready to develop solar we have a clear understanding of where that's going to go and how to expedite that so we can meet our goals. Um, I think that's it. All right. Thank you very much, Laura. And finally, we have Sharon Weitzenbaum. Uh, Pam, if you could move her over. And Sharon. state your name and your address. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. I'm Sharon Weitzenbaum, 86 Henry Street in Amherst. And um, I, I just wanted to comment on what Steve Roof said, um, because I was at the planning board meeting last week and he gave a presentation that was a, um, about the plan for Massachusetts for industrial solar with a focus on energy production. And it really didn't say anything about the ecological impact or um, you know, anything else or the environmental impact um, anything else other than this is how much energy we could create and this is what we need to make our goals. So um, he was saying that the moratorium isn't really emphasizing the positive aspects of solar, but I just want to point out that his presentation didn't emphasize anything about the negative impact of only having a focus on the uh, how much energy we can produce. So it has to really go both ways. And so I encourage us all to really think about the 
benefits. And I really applaud the last speaker. You know, felt that felt very um, even handed. Um, and so I think we really have to think about that. And and I also want to say that on December twelfth, there's a forum in Shutesbury that will look at like other ways that we can produce solar other than this, other than clear cutting the forest. So anyway, I'm in total support of the moratorium to give us some time to think carefully about these issues. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sharon. All right, so uh, that was actually a pretty small number of public comments. So um, I think we could go ahead and have some deliberation. I am, since uh, we have Patricia and Lynn with us this evening, um, um, I would like to just pose a couple of specific questions to them uh, in case they're not able to join us next at our next meeting. Um, these questions come from the questions that we compiled from the various planning board members in advance of uh, this meeting. We, we knew we needed to get up to speed with it and, and solicited questions from all the board members. Um, so the first question was, uh, to, what are the current deficiencies with the current process to approve large solar arrays in Amherst from your perspective or from the perspective of your constituents? Pat, do you wanna go? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, no, that's fine. I, well, ahead, there's, there's many bylaws. And I, first of all, I want to just recognize um, Chris and Rob Mora and the rest of the planning staff. Rather than um, have people flounder around with um, the expertise needed to really look at a good bylaw, um, we actually went to to the town manager and said, maybe talk to the planning staff. And they agreed. And the upshot is that many of the issues that you've raised have been addressed in their responses back to you. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like working with the experts. I'm not a solar expert. I appreciate the fact that others of you may be a solar expert. On the other hand, when my husband and I had the opportunity to install enough solar on the back of our lot uh, to run all our entire household, we did. And we we're still paying for it. So I'm not against solar in any way, shape or form. I am, however, also for the environment. So going back to this, what I think was so shocking to me is Amherst thinks of itself as this wonderful, progressive with it town. And yet we found when we started really looking at this is we don't have a solar bylaw. We have a bylaw that talks about this and a bylaw that talks about that, but we don't have anything that pulls it all together. And so that's what this is about. It's trying to do thinking, it's trying to do planning, it's trying to be careful about how we go forward and how we do it so we do it right. Yeah, I was wondering if Rob, would you um, like to share anything about the current bylaw that, um, is on the books is not directly about solar, but it's about, well, um, is that um, a possibility? Go ahead, Rob. Sure, uh, so our current bylaw, um, you know, isn't really specifically designed for solar installations itself. Um, so it's a more general category for energy uh, generating facilities um, and, we really have to rely on the 10.38 findings in the special permit uh, review process. And, you know, a lot of these things or some of these things could be tied or connected to those findings, uh, but it isn't, it isn't readily available and in and, and, and clear view to the permit granting board to follow through a bylaw criteria. So they really have to be um, either educated or prompt to, um, to address some of these issues that we're hoping that uh, a future solar bylaw will be able to that the current uh, bylaw does not. Thank you. All right, so the second um, question was, why are, you, why are you proposing this now rather than you know, at the beginning of your term two or three years ago? We've obviously been 
had a smattering of solar arrays installed in Amherst prior to this? Um, bluntly, I was focused on too many other things like getting a new form of government up and running. Um, so that's my biggest excuse. But the reality is I didn't become aware until my own neighbors and my own district felt residents called attention to the fact that we didn't have this. And I wanna recognize the fact that we've got residents in Amherst who are in fact quite smart about some of these things. And as they began looking at this and looking at what could happen to the woods right behind their house, they realized we had nothing out there of, in the way of a solar bylaw. So we came forward, we met with them and we said, I think we need to look at this seriously. I, I make no excuses for the fact that we didn't do this three years ago, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't do it now. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the next one was, why is a moratorium needed rather than having town council simply direct the planning board to make, and staff uh, to make to this a priority for the creation of the new bylaw? I think that's been answered by several people, including some of the public comment. From, we do need the time to understand what it is that we need to do. Um, what, what are the, you know, looking at uh, Shootsbury's bylaw and looking at all the different bylaws that I've been looking at and trying to figure out how to work this, um, I've come to realize that Amherst is different than each one of these communities, yet there are elements from each of the towns that we can use. So I'm really trying to figure out the ways to collaborate with the conservation committee, with the planning department to really, and ECAC, um, you know, to really understand what we need. And that's why a solar study is important. What I want is time. I think that when we're looking at the, we're specifically talking about the Shootsbury Road and, and that development that pushed Lynn and I over, um, not an edge, but pushed us forward. Because for me, I really want to address what will happen if there is uh, damage to wells, if the water table is affected. I want to know uh, whether or not the developer would be responsible for that, for, uh, cleaning that up just like they are uh, re would be responsible for decommissioning. So there are elements to look at. All we're asking for is time. Uh, believe me, I believe that we need to go green in Amherst. I've done a deep energy retrofit on my house. I have solar panels. So it's not something that's new in that sense. Um, I think we, Lynn said it more simply, we've been sidelined by a lot of issues, including um, racial injustice and other things that have pulled the pool community apart and is also bringing the community together. So this got put pushed off. It did get pushed off on my part anyway. So we need the moratorium to give us space to do it well, to do it in a style that Amherst can be really proud of. Thank you. Um... I think the last question I'm going to just skip. Um, I think a couple of the public uh, commenters brought up the, the points that were raised in that last question. Um, since that was a question from Johanna, do you have any objection to that? Um, uh, you're muted. I think I know what you're saying, which is that a, a handful of the public comments alluded to the fact that uh, the bylaw treats solar as like a noisome trade rather than something that actually has a lot of societal benefits. And it, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm okay yeah. holding off on that. Okay, all right. Um, all right, so we have, uh, let's see, Chris, actually, Lynn, I see your hand. Yeah, um, I have no problem looking for more encouraging and positive language that we can weave into the moratorium? None at all. If it comes across to people as being anti-solar, that is not the intention. It is in no way the intention. 
So if one of the recommendations or one of the requirements from the planning board is that we create other language that states that in a better way, I think that's a great suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Chris. Sorry, I was muted. Um, so I just wanted to say a few things. Um, so to date, our bylaw has sufficed. I think that the installations that we've seen have been um, not as large as the one that was proposed at Shootsbury Road. And so um, I think the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Planning Board have done a really good job in asking a lot of the right questions. And um, we have not had the problems with our solar installation that have been described by Pat. Um, the fact that this proposal on Shootsbury Road was much bigger than things that we've seen in the past may you know, be supportive of um, a moratorium, although I'm not um, personally going to make a de declaration about how I, I stand in that regard. But I think it gives us all time to learn about um, you know, some of the issues. And I'm particularly interested in asking a question, which since we have um, Laura Drucker here and Steve Roof, if they could briefly describe what is a solar assessment and point us in the direction of um, the types of consultants who might be helpful in that regard or um, resources that might be helpful and um, you know, necess doesn't necessarily have to ask answer that question now, but if they could email me that information or give it to Stephanie Ciccarello and she could forward it to us. You know, so we're we're sort of in a learning curve right now, and um, I'm just expressing a willingness to learn and to work with everybody to make this a, a good effort. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, um, Steve and Laura, since you are in the attendees, um, would you want to make a comment in response to Chris's question? If so, you can raise your hand, and if not, uh, you can just do your communication offline. So I see Steve's hand. Uh, can we bring him over? Thank you. Yes, thank you. And I'm uh, speaking as a member of ECAC now. We just earlier this evening talked about this, and our plan is to do exactly that. Um, hopefully, at our next meeting, we will have uh, will approve a letter that will forward to you with our recommendations for a solar assessment study or solar study. And Stephanie is also exploring how we might do that um, through a consultant. So. Yes, we're doing that. Stay tuned. Great. Thank you. And I don't see Laura responding, so I think that's probably the response we'll get for this, this conversation. Jack, at long last, what do you want to tell us? Well, now, um, so I, I, I heard Pat talk about groundwater. That's what I do. And uh, and I, I have done, a, you know, I have done an, a detailed study of a site, uh, actually, I think it was in Oxford, Mass. And um, I would not, you know, raise the flag with regard to um, solar developments, you know, degrading groundwater. In, in actuality, uh, you know, when you have all that vegetation, forest, all that, you lose a lot of groundwater. Um, through evapotranspiration. So the trees just suck a lot of groundwater up and you're putting a solar, you know, with, with grass. And so you're not gonna have a groundwater availability issue with the solar installation on a property because you are going to increase the recharge, groundwater recharge, uh, you know, within that, within that area. And, you know, again, you mentioned a few towns that had disasters but those are all, I think those are all like, uh, you know, monitoring issues in terms of, you know, stormwater, uh, you know, erosion sort of things that, that, that are separate from, from this. So those towns did not do their job, uh, I think, if you're going to, you know, raise those up and, and apply them to Amherst. You know, they did not do their job in terms of the stormwater, you know, and erosion sort of. Uh, you know, mitigation measures that should have been in place. So that, that the, you know, I just don't think that applies. 
and um, I think I had some other ideas, but <laughs> I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, thank you. Well, I guess um, I, I feel I, I want to say, um, you know, the last question we asked had to do with why do we need a moratorium rather than just having town council direct planning staff and the planning department uh, board to make this a priority. And the, the answer I expected was that there's a risk that one or two more projects might happen and that they might be a disaster. Um, but neither of you said that. Um, and, and I guess if that were the, were the answer, that there's a risk that, there, that something bad might happen before we get our bylaw completed, um, well, you know, given our track record of not having problems, um, you know, I guess I just wonder how big a risk that really is. So um, I guess I, I wanted to just say that. And then I guess I wanna ask the board, um, this afternoon you did receive a, a PDF copy of the questions that we've asked the staff and, um, and along with the staff answers. And I wanna first thank Chris and, and anybody that gave her a hand with answering those questions. Um, obviously given the marathon town, council meeting you sat through on Monday night, I can imagine uh, you weren't at your best yesterday or today. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, I guess uh, I wanted to know if, if, any of the count, if any of the board members wanted us to go through those questions. Um, have they, and Chris, were they in anybody's, were they part of the packet that will be available to the public or not? Um, I can ask Pam and I'll ask her right now to post the questions um, on as an adjunct to the packet for tonight. And I'm sure she'd be happy to do okay, that. Okay, because I do, you know, if we don't actually go through all of them tonight, uh, I do want to make sure the public is, is able to see how you guys answered that. Uh, I think we all have a, a, a task to educate ourselves about this whole area. Um, Pat, I see your hand. Thank you. Um, I just briefly wanted to uh, respond to Jack a little bit, who you certainly know um, much more than I do about uh, groundwater and things, but what you spoke about were monitoring issues and mitigation issues. That's why we need to create the bylaw, and that's why we need the moratorium. We're really looking for a balance, and when we say that risk is minimal, there are, I think, I would love to see no risk, but we really need to look, we're talking about projects that in the Shutesbury Road, they're talking about 45 acres of forest being gone. What's the balance there? And I need to do more work to research what is the balance? What, it, what effect will that have on wells in that area? What effect will it have? Because those trees are sequestering carbon which is critically important, but they're also producing oxygen. So we're talking about 45 acres, that's larger than the whole of the Amethyst Brook Conservation Area. So all we're saying, honestly, is we need to look at this carefully and look at it together and, and really create a bylaw that's gonna protect us so that we can really minimize risk. And so, so me, me as a, that, as a lay person, I can trust what you're saying that I can. And so I would love to learn from you and, and build together with that. So I want the time for that and um, I hope you'll help us get it. Okay, thank you. Um, Johanna, since uh, you were the principal collaborator with me on the questions, how do you feel about whether we should go through them or whether we should just leave them for everyone to read on their own. And, uh, and then, you know, we could certainly refer to them next time or, you know, since they just came out this afternoon, it might be a little bit of a short window for people to start to digest them. Um, honestly, I could go either way. I imagine 
it will like if we go through them, I think it will prompt other people to have their questions or like to have questions arise. So, okay, you know, that, that it might be a valuable exercise doing it as a group. Okay, good. Well, you know, we obviously have a little more time than I expected this evening, Chris. And maybe after Jack, maybe after Chris and Jack, we'll just start through the questions. I think it would be a good idea to go through the questions because it would educate people about the way we deal with it now and, and how, you know, how Amherst deals with these things now. I think that would be informative. And we okay. did not answer all the questions and we're still working on a map. And I think we may also be working on sizes of projects that have already been approved. So um, there'll be more that will come out uh, if you choose to continue your uh, public hearing to the next planning board meeting. We'll, we'll have more information for you, but I think it would be a good idea to go through the questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jack? I just, um, I just want to say that um, solar developments are, are, have so many impediments to, you know, their permitting process as is the interconnective uh, or interconnection uh, agreement that you need with Eversource or National Grid. It, it's a, it's a, it's an abom abomination, sorry. Uh, so, so this moratorium is just, I feel like is more on top of the difficulty for solar development already. And, um, you know, so I, I, I you know, who, who can argue against you know, solar as being a good thing. And I think the ZBA, boy, they, they drill down deep and I just feel like they do their job. And that's why the, the, the projects, you know, within Amherst that have, uh, uh, you know, gone through that process have been, you know, adequately vetted. So this, again, uh, I'm not a real fan of the moratorium, uh, you know, for those, for those reasons. All right. Thank you. And Tom, do you want to say anything before we start the questions? Um, sure. Just first to thank you both for um, all of these questions, which I realized I would have had if I had your questions in front of me, they would have been my questions. So I appreciate your insight on that. Um, what I actually found really interesting and, and why I think it's worth it to go through this is for people to recognize um, that through your questions, you, you illuminated the fact that there is a process there are ways in which we can put conditions on things. There's a, a timeline for those things. And um, that there are projects that have already been realized and, and, uh, and approved. And, and to see the landscape of the, the process through which these projects go, I think is really valuable um, for people to see this. Just because you want to put up a giant solar field doesn't mean that everyone's just going to approve it and it's going to happen. There's actually a process, people are looking at it and scrutinizing it and they can put conditions on it however they want to. Um, and that the, if you go back and look at some of those um, previously approved projects, there's, there's a lot of discussion there and they do drill down. And, and so I think it's important for you to recognize that it isn't a free pass, no matter what. Um, and so, you know, my question in terms of this, which I'll get to later if we have more time for discussion, um, is really about why a moratorium to stop all things rather than you know, put some criteria in place uh, for people to consider during the process that is going on right now while we develop um, a, a set of criteria and a new uh, zoning amendment in the future. So maybe both and, I guess, is what I would be looking for. So anyway, I do think it's worthwhile to go through these because I think I found value in understanding the process a little bit. Um, okay. So um, I thank you. Okay, Maria. Uh, thanks. Yeah, and no, I, I totally agree with what you were just saying, Tom. And I actually submitted a couple questions while I was at parent pickup at high school right before break. And I sent them to you, Doug, and they were mainly because I understood the moratorium as, you know, let's pause and refine the process. But then I thought, okay, so I kind of took a step back, kind of like that question you asked, Doug, like, well, why now? And what's wrong with the process we have now? And so then my questions were, where are the failures? Have we had failures in Amherst? And um, that's probably in the list. So I'd love to go through Yeah, that. actually, I mean, you're reminding me, I, I, I need to give you credit too. Uh, you did, <laughs> I, did, I did get your questions. And, and uh, hopefully as we go through these, you'll see how I, I think yours were very close to some of the other ones that, that you know, Hannah and I had. Oh, okay. So I tried to just meld them into one question and, and cover yeah. every kind of the nuances that everybody had. 
Okay, great. So, yeah, and no, I really uh, appreciate the staff taking time to yeah, answer that. And I have I, not had time. Thank you for before. reminding me. So but, um, um, yeah, it'd be great to go through that list. Okay, so um, I guess uh, for Pam, do you have these questions available to put on the screen? I do. And if so, could you go ahead and do that? Great. Are you seeing it? Yes. OK. OK. All right. So um, I guess the we'll just kind of slog through these. And as people see things they want to ask, just raise your hand. Uh, and um, I'll try to make sure I keep looking for, for hands. Um, so which section of the bylaw currently controls large solar arrays? Um, actually, Chris, would it be helpful for you to, to, to read this or should I at least read the questions and you can talk about the answers? That sounds like a good idea. All right, so, so there's question one, you know, how do we currently control these types of arrays? So in um, most cases, we control them uh, via section 3.2. 340.0, which is called transformer station or other energy facility or use. So that's um, for projects that are standalone uh, solar arrays, um, such as the project at Pulpit Hill or the one that's between Sunderland Road and Montague Road. Um, and it would have been the case for the upcoming project on Shutesbury Road. There are other projects like the one at Hampshire College and the one at Atkins Farm where we control them because we consider them accessory to the use that is primary on the site. So Atkins Farm was using the solar uh, power that they generated to uh, power their facility. They weren't selling it to anybody. And the same is true of Hampshire College. So those two arrays were approved as accessory uses to the primary use. They were considered by the planning board rather than the zoning board of appeals. Um, so that's a little bit of a nuance to the answer to the first question. All right, and Johanna, I see your hand. Thank you very much, Doug. It's interesting because I heard a couple of times tonight um, various people say that we don't have a solar bylaw, but it sounds like we have an energy facility bylaw, which extends to solar. So it's, you know, I don't know, like, I, I feel like not having an, saying that we don't have a solar bylaw makes it sound like solar farms are unregulated in Amherst. And that's just not true under current rules. So it, just elucidating that and kind of bringing that to the fore, which yeah. I think is and, and Chris, am I right if someone wanted to put up a, uh, you know, a wind turbine, would that be under the same section? Yep, mm -hmm. it would be. Okay. All right, great. So then uh, question two, uh, in which zoning districts are large solar arrays allowed by right? And, by, and which by site plan review or special permit? So they're not allowed by right anywhere other than if you consider site plan review by right, which some people do by right with site plan review by the planning board. So solar arrays, standalone large solar arrays are permitted in the commercial district and the light industrial district with site plan review from the planning board. But as I said previously, if it's an accessory use to a primary use, it could also be approved by the planning board depending on which board is um, controlling over the primary use. Um, these uh, installations are controlled by special permit in most um, zoning districts. And you can see all of the zoning districts that are listed there where it is possible to have uh, a solar array and have it be uh, by special permit with the Zoning Board of Appeals. I think state law says that you can't, um, you know, un unjustly or unduly, I don't know exactly, un unreasonably regulate um, solar installations because the state has a, a big stake in making solar possible and trying to encourage it. So um, when we bring it to the Zoning Board of Appeals, we're assuming that the Zoning Board of Appeals won't deny the request for a special permit if the um, proposal meets the uh, 
um, dimensional and other regulations in the bylaw and meets wetlands regulations, et cetera. So if it, if it fits, it, it wouldn't be um, denied for a, for a reason that wasn't clearly associated with some regulation in the zoning bylaw. Okay. Uh, but it looks like the general answer is these things are allowed anywhere in town. That's correct. And, right. and, and depending on the zone, they either have to go through site plan review or they have to go through special permit. And there's never a situation where they don't have to do one or the other of those two processes. That's correct. And most of the time there is some wetland component or some component that brings the conservation commission in as well. We didn't mention that here, but um, if there's oh, yeah. a yeah, that was, wetland that, that, within a hundred feet, then it goes to the conservation commission. Yeah. And so obviously if it's a site that is not within a hundred feet of a of a well, well, wetland resource. Uh, the Conservation Commission is not automatically involved. Is that right? Probably not, unless there's, um, I think they may have jurisdiction over environmental, um, you know, areas where there's a special kind of animal or plant or something like that. Uh -huh. So those would be um, viewed either by the, the town or the state. Um, I forget exactly what that's called, but um, I'm sure there's someone in the audience who can um, bring that up if you need to know it. All right. Um, let's see. I am. Whoops. I was seeing a hand from Anna. Uh, yeah. Anna, do you want to make a comment from the audience? Pam, are you able to bring Anna Gauthier over? I'm not sure, Doug, because I'm sharing my screen. Are you able to give her permission to speak? Let's see. Did I ever make you the, the co-host? I bet I didn't make the co-host. Yes. Okay, yeah, I now I, I just okay. did. So Anna, I believe you should be able to speak now. Yeah, hi. So um, just really briefly, I am on the Conservation Commission. Um, just really briefly, sorry, my dog just decided to sit on my lap. Uh, we do, if natural heritage does deem that there is a species of, of uh, concern or interest, then we are involved. Um, I will just say, though, CONCOM truly, any project that extends past the buffer, we have no say in anything that's past the buffer zone of the wetland or, or vernal pool. So, you know, when you look at, I guess, to use the example of the, the uh, proposal on Shootsbury Road, you can see the wetlands were carved out or the vernal pool was carved out in the middle if you look at the site plan. Um, and we can't, we can't touch pretty much anything beyond that. We can ask about phasing of plans and things like that, Jack, to get at your point. There's significant concern with the phasing of these projects for groundwater. Um, in terms of how the runoff happens. And um, there's ways that the projects are phased that can minimize that, but uh, there's nowhere that, there's no bylaw that states how that phasing should be done, right? There's nothing, there's no regulation on that. So and by, there, and by, the, by the phasing, you mean the sequence of clearing the land and correct. installing the new uh, panels? Yep. Installing the, the, the pads, the towers, or not the towers, the pads, the panels, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it, that, that phasing really does matter because if you leave ground exposed, it gets compacted and, and that impacts the runoff, right? So uh -huh. um, we, we can't, there's nothing in our bylaw right now about that. Um, and so we, and, and, and these, you know, the engineers are, they're smart. They hold us to our bylaw and, and, and don't let us go past it. And so um, they, which is well within their rights. And so, um, yes, we are, we are limited to that scope of wetlands and vernal pools. And rivers and streams, pretty much anything wet, wet or endangered. That's our purview. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Chris, did you raise your hand again or is that a legacy? No, legacy, sorry. All right. So Pam, why don't we scroll down to uh, the, the third question? All right. What is the process for review and approval? And Chris, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Um, so the process uh, involves um, submit, submission of an application and the staff, you know, thoroughly reviews the application. Um, it involves notification of abutters and property owners within 300 feet. 
There's a publication of a legal notice in a local newspaper. And then whichever board is reviewing the application would hold a public hearing. And um, the decision would be rendered by the board with jurisdiction. All right. Uh, I don't see any hands. So why don't we go down to the fourth question? There's a second yeah. part to the third. Oh, OK. Part, yeah. What are the roles of the planning board and the zoning board? And we may have already covered that. So. Yeah, it's pretty much, you know, the planning board um, holds a public hearing for those things that require site plan review. The Zoning Board of Appeals holds a public hearing for things that require a special permit. And in both cases, the planning department sends out transmittals to town departments, such as the Health Department and Department of Public Works, which includes the town engineer and police and fire and inspection services, et cetera, seeking comments and um, prior to the public hearing. And the board holds site visits prior to the public hearing. All right. All right. Uh, question four. Can you provide a list of the arrays approved to, to Am in Amherst to date with their acreage and date of approval or installation? So we do have a list here. We don't have the acreage or date of approval or installation, but we do have whether they were actually built or if they were just proposed. So as I said, we had um, Atkins Farm Market has a small solar array at the corner of their property on Bay Road. Hampshire College has a rather large solar array along Bay Road, which is, I believe, visible from, this, from the road. Mm -hmm. um, my, uh, the Montague Road solar uh, is a big array that is between Sunderland Road and Montague Road. And um, you can see it from, certainly from Sunderland Road. I think I've also heard that someone who lives on Montague Road can see it from her home, but it's kind of down in a valley. Um, then there's a solar array at Pulpit Hill Road, which is kind of hidden by, um, by the forest to, to a large degree, but there is a trail that goes right by it, so you can see it from the trail. Then this one that's called Dave Wasenda, he's the former owner of uh, Hickory Ridge Golf Course, so um, there is a proposed array uh, on Hickory Ridge Golf Course at the very northern uh, end of it, um, where it abuts um, the Mill Valley apartments and some of the other apartments that also abut uh, East Hadley Road. Um, so that is expected to be built. The town is hoping to purchase the Hickory Ridge Golf Course and part of the town's um, acquisition will include an agreement to go ahead and, and have that solar array built. Um, and then we have the town of Amherst solar array, which is due to be built on the landfill, which is on the north side of Belchertown Road. Um, there was one proposed for the south side, but that ran into a lot of problems. So we moved to the north side and that was permitted by the planning board. It's where the transfer station is essentially on that big mound. So those, those are the things. Great. That All right. And then uh, the fifth question has to do with what, what kind of conditions typically have been imposed on the arrays construct or approved to date? So I believe these are mostly conditions that the Zoning Board of Appeals has um, has imposed. I'm not sure if, they're, if they include planning board conditions, but they would be very similar. So um, if there are changes to the plan, uh, the applicant is required to come back to the board to get those changes approved. Um, there's an operations and maintenance plan, which needs to be submitted and approved by the board. Um, there's a requirement for installation of safety and warning signage along the fence to alert people that there's electricity in there. Um, there's always a fence requirement. Um, the site can't be used for storage of vehicles and equipment. In other words, we don't want it to look um, poorly, we want it to just have the solar array there and not be used as a, a storage place uh, for any other thing other than the solar array itself. Um, it can't be constructed until the utility company confirms the interconnection agreement, and that's what um, Jack was speaking about earlier. It is kind of a, a long process to get that interconnection agreement, so we don't want the solar array to be in place and then not have anybody who's willing to take the, the power from it. Um, there has to be a construction logistics plan, and this is something that the building commissioner 
uh, is very um, clear about and um, insistent about, and it goes through a lot of, um, you know, where do the in the contractors park, and when can they actually do their work, and you know, how um, what kind of uh, inspections have to go on uh, as far as um, you know, setting up the site with erosion control and all of those things. There's a long list of things that go into the construction plan. Um, and then the, the fire department is involved because there may be a fire on the site and we wanna make sure that the fire department can get in there and no, be notified. And so that is an important um, aspect as well. And then there are also landscaping requirements. So there's screening from adjacent properties um, and the plants have to be installed and continually maintained. So in other words, if they die, they have to be replaced. All of the disturbed areas has to have to be loamed and seeded or um, planted with something that will keep the soil from eroding. Uh, the tree removal follows the approved site plan. So we're clear on the site plan of which trees have to be removed or which areas of trees. And trees that are removed uh, are replaced at the end of the um, solar energy system when it is removed. And that I remember was particularly an issue on Hickory Ridge, because I think there were, there are going to be 191 trees removed there. And the permit was explicit that 191 trees need to be put back at the end when the solar system is removed. Um, there's a prohibition against use of pesticides and herbicides. And then there's a decommissioning plan. Um, so the applicant needs to provide the town, specifically the building commissioner, with a, a plan for decommissioning the project when it's done using it. Um, the, everything has to be removed within a year of the, of the ceasing of use. And the building commissioner requires a bond that is um, prorated based on inflation uh, to a point where we know that um, you know, in 20 years when they remove this thing, we're going to have enough money to uh, remove it ourselves if the applicant is not able to remove it. So we don't want to be stuck with something that's been installed and the applicant has disappeared and we want to be able to go in and, um, and remove it. Um, so what else do we have? Um, we require the applicant to adhere to the approved permit with the conditions uh, imposed by the Conservation Commission. And um, we require public online access to power and energy reporting um, for the Amherst Solar Landfill Project. And they have to report to the Amherst Energy and Climate Action Committee. All right, great. Um, so the next question, uh, relates back to, to the tree. Oh, go ahead. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks. I, I did go have ahead, a couple. Thank you, Doug. I, I did have a couple of quick questions on this. So um, it sounds like, you know, just based on some of the questions we had earlier, there were concerns around the overall, you know, maintenance of the plan. Is there any, is there any expected difference in how the maintenance plan would be enforced via a special permit versus through a modified bylaw, which is to say like, would we have more protection um, if a bylaw were in place or, or would these conditions as part of the special permit essentially provide us the same level of, of protection? How, how about Rob? Would Rob be the right one to answer that, Chris? Yeah. Sure. Um, I think the difference would be that the bylaw might might be um, more um, specific on the criteria that's being um, expected to be provided by the applicant. But as far as enforcement goes, if it's a clear condition of the special permit, whether it's written as a condition of the permit or um, referencing the um, the the maintenance plan that's provided by the applicant, they are both equally enforced uh, by inspection services staff. So in that regard, there wouldn't be any difference. Okay. And then a really quick fast follow, Doug, is does anybody know the expected life uh, of, uh, of a solar array? Uh, I'm seeing Anna's hand and, and Johanna. Why don't we, Anna, Johanna, why don't you go first? Unless you have your, your mouth full. Sorry, I, my kids just brought me dinner. Um, 
the technology is evolving, but I think 25 years is a like decent ballpark. All right. Let's see what Anna has to say. Yeah. Well, she, she put her when hand I, down. I, when I saw Johanna's hand, I put my hand down. Sorry. I was going to say 30. So yep. Same, same ballpark. Okay. And I assume these things uh, slowly decline in the output. They don't just one day decide we're done. Um, yeah, they, you know, they kind of degrade over time. The, um, so they're at peak on the first, you know, zero, like zero to 10 years and then slowly that they degrade and then, you know, so they don't produce quite as much energy in the latter part of their life cycle as they do early on. Okay. Uh, and well, I guess it also occurs to me what do you do with an old solar panel? Is it recyclable? I mean, there's a lot of glass in it. Johanna, any ideas? Um, there are definitely companies that are exploring this, but it's, you know, like kind of like anything, some things get recycled and repurposed and some of them end up in the waste stream. And, you know, Hopefully we get to a place where there's a closed loop and we can recycle all the components, but I don't think that that industry is like fully up and running yet. Okay, thank you. All right, Pam, why don't we scroll down to the next question? All right, so this question had to do with the trees and I, I one of those conditions we had earlier about replacing trees that are cut down and um, maybe requiring some sort of buffer. So in districts where solar arrays are allowed, is there any restriction on a landowner's ability to cut down trees? In other words, could a landowner cut down their tree right now, their, you know, clear cut their land, regardless of what they intend to do with their land next year? So in, gen in general, landowners are allowed to cut trees on their property. There are some restrictions with regard to um, scenic roads where you can't cut trees along a scenic road unless you uh, get permission from the planning board and the, um, and the tree warden. Um, and then there are also restrictions having to do with um, conservation commission. But in general, um, landowners are allowed to cut their trees. There's also a reference here to the stormwater bylaw that the town council adopted in May. Um, other than that, um, if there aren't any conditions from the conservation commission, and I'm, oh, I'm also noting that there could be a conservation restriction on the property, which might uh, have um, language that says you can't cut trees, but in general, landowners are allowed to cut trees. Okay. All right, the next, um, all right, had to do with whether we've had any complaints or negative re impacts uh, as a result of any of the arrays installed and approved around town, um, you know, or any surrounding towns, if we know of any, and um, does, would that include runoff problems as seen in Hopkinton and Williamsburg? So we don't keep track of what happens in other towns. We're certainly willing to learn about that, but we're, you know, we're not in the position of keeping track of that. But we do know that there have been some complaints about um, the solar arrays, particularly there was one uh, landowner on Montague Road who um, complained about the solar panels glinting into her uh, office, which is on the second floor of her home, particularly in the winter when the leaves are off the trees, and she really was uncomfortable about that. Um, she, there was another, uh, there was a butter and a butter uh, to the Pulpit Hill Road project who complained about standing water on the ground. Um, and let's see, Belchertown Road, there were concerns about the exposure to electromagnetic fields expressed by um, and a butter, uh, I believe that was to the east of the of the proposed project. Um, and I'm not sure what this last. Uh, well, that had to do with the magnetic fields response. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So there, so there were some studies that were submitted um, regarding magnetic fields, and and we have that information available if anybody is interested in looking at it. All right. 
Okay, so, and then specifically has the town engineer or the Department of Public Works received any calls or complaints about wells issues, septic system issues uh, in the vicinity of these installations? We've reached so, out to the DPW and we haven't heard back from them, the DPW okay. and the town engineer. All right. Uh, number nine, how much electricity is produced in Amherst and how much electricity do we consume? Uh, what percentage of our overall use is locally harnessed renewable energy? And I'm sure that's a little bit complicated by the presence of UMass and their, uh, their uh, you know, their power system and their central central plant. Mm -hmm. But uh, to the extent you can find answers for that, that'd be great. So you'd like us to delve into what UMass has? Or well, does. I mean, I see your 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 statement here. Municipal and electricity use was six point five megawatts, and I assume that means that's what the town uh, offices used. That's a good question. Um, we should have information on what um, residential property owners use as well. So maybe we will um, ask the question of uh, Stephanie Ciccarello, who is uh, the sustainability coordinator. So exactly what does number nine, what does the answer to that include, right? Is, um, yeah, well, I think, I think, you know, I think, Johanna, uh, you can fill in here, you are muted. Um, yeah, I my, guess my- Go, go ahead. Okay. My rationale in asking this is that, you know, Amherst, um, I believe it was in 2016, um, we town meeting passed a bylaw, basically setting a goal of Amherst meeting its 100% of its electricity needs with clean renewable energy. And I imagine, I don't quite know where we are on that journey. I imagine we're not at 100% yet. I think statewide for Massachusetts, we're around 25%. And, you know, I think in the spirit of sustainability, we want some, you know, we don't want to just import all of that clean energy from other towns, right? We don't want to be a, I don't know, like burden other communities with all of our energy production. We want to produce some of that locally. So I'm just trying to get a sense of like, where are we now? Steve Roof may be able to answer that, or Laura Drucker, if they're still here. Well, um, I believe Steve, well, Steve's gone. Oh, no, he isn't. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think your best source will be Stephanie. The, the town did have a um, greenhouse gas inventory report completed a couple of years ago, and that did look at total town use by the municipality. It looked at residential and institutional use, UMass and the different colleges. Um, that was several years ago. It has changed. And yes, I think that's going to be a very complicated answer, a question to answer, um, given the differences. Uh, you know, UMass, it, it, I don't know how good the data were from UMass. And then I know at Hampshire College, we use a lot of that behind the meter. So it's hard to exactly account for the total generation and the contribution to the town. But, but yeah, that the greenhouse gas uh, inventory report will probably be your best source. All right, thank you, Steve. Andrew. Yeah, yes, <clears throat> thanks Doug, uh, maybe piling on. Would, you know, would a, a solar array built on private property, would the town count that towards, you know, the output of that, would they count that towards our goal of having the zero sustainability, regardless of who actually consumes that power? I don't know how it's, I don't know how we measure that. I don't have the answer to that question. Maybe one of the other um, participants does have that answer. Uh, Steve. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you, oh, you can still hear me. Yeah, yeah, that's a tough one. Um, normally, when a, any solar project gets approved by the state, the uh, under the old program, the SRECs or Solar Renewable Energy Credits go um, are sold by the owner of the project that helped finance the project, and then they count towards this Massachusetts Renewable Portfolio Standard, which gives us right now I think it's close to twenty percent of our renewable energy. So that renewable energy kind of gets counted for the state goal, 
and then it's kind of inappropriate to count it a second time as achieving for Amherst School. But almost every solar project does that. And in fact, with the new system, the smart system, there aren't SRECs, the renewable credits go straight to the state. So all solar helps in the renewable energy that's used in Massachusetts. Um, you know, of course, it's all distributed out through the grid, so you don't know where the electrons are going, but any solar project will help advance the goal, both for Amherst and for the state of meeting its climate action goals. Okay, yeah, I mean, I, I understand it's it's a positive and it really doesn't matter where it goes as long as we're making it, but I, I was, again, curious, like, how will we know we did it, right, is like ultimately the question. And I understand yeah. people, we can't answer that now, that's fine. Just it's, it's, Yeah, I think, I think we, Chris, uh, maybe if you guys can think a little more about that. You know, mm -hmm. I think the, the gist of the question is if we put a, a fence around Amherst and counted every electron that is imported and, you know, how much of it are we importing versus how much our total usage is, but I, maybe... I, yeah, I don't even mean that so much as as how much is produced within the town, regardless of where it's consumed. Just, you know, are we producing an amount that's equal to the amount that we're using? Doesn't right. matter where the electron is actually going. But right. Thanks. Okay. All right. Well, you know, Chris, see see what you can come up with. Thank you. Yep. Uh, let's scroll down to number ten. All right, so now we're getting into electricity and how much area it takes to generate it. What is the typical power generating capacity of, a, of an array per acre in Amherst? We understand from talking to, actually from our, our town attorney that um, a typical solar array that's 250 kilowatts takes up about an acre of land. That's what we've learned from okay. them. All and right. It's considered large scale. Doesn't sound very large scale. So this, so this moratorium would be affecting anything that's roughly an acre in size. That's right, or, or greater. And yeah. larger, okay. All right, so then number 11, what is, which is more effective at reducing or slowing the buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, an acre of woodland or an acre of solar panels? In other words, how does the carbon sequestration capacity of an acre of forest compare to the fossil fuel carbon emissions avoided by generating the same amount of electricity from an acre of uh, an array? So this is a complicated question. And we need to um, seek consultants to help us to answer it. And in fact, I um, put in a request today to get some consultation, one to help us um, create our solar bylaw and two to help us answer this question because I think it's an, an important question, but I also think that you may get different answers to this question. Okay, well, it's probably yeah. like one of the usual answers which is it depends, but... Uh... <laughs> Um, I see Steve's hand. You, maybe you have a comment about that? Uh, yes, I, I have looked into this and I can tell you since I manage the solar fields at Hampshire College and I know exactly how much energy they've generated, um, they avoid 133 metric tons of CO2 per acre per year. The 133 metric tons of CO2 avoided per acre per year. Um, that's by offsetting fossil fuel um, electricity. And then in, I looked up in the um, Massachusetts decarbonization roadmap report, they note that there are 5 million acres of forest in Massachusetts that sequester, um, Sorry, I'm scrolling to find that number. Sequestered 3.3 million acres, or sorry, 3.3 million tons of carbon dioxide per year. So by 5 million acres of forest, 3.3 million tons of CO2 works out to 1.5 tons of CO2 per year 
sequestered by a forest. So it's about a hundred times uh, solar fields sequester or avoid the emission of CO2 about a factor of a hundred times more than a Massachusetts forest. Okay. And you All will right. get different answers um, from different people, but it's still roughly two orders of magnitude. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I will say I did, I did Google that kind of question and, um, you know, you do find a lot of different answers, but in, in most cases, it did seem like the solar, solar array was, uh, had a much bigger impact than uh, the forest area. Okay, um, so Chris, we'll see what comes from the inquiries you made for a consultant. Number 12, how much of Amherst's total land mass is forests? How much is solar? What percentage of those forests could potentially be converted to a solar array under current rules? And what percentage is conservation land, I, AKA forest forever land that cannot be touched? Uh, Chris, you are muted. You're still, yeah, there you go. Oh, yeah. One of our staff members, Ben Breger, who's very clever at um, figuring out mapping, um, is going to figure this out. He's working on it now. I think he actually had an answer, but he wanted to check it with a few people. Okay. He, uh, you know, put, made it public. All right. I'm seeing a couple of hands in the public. So, Steve, did you have a comment? Okay, you took your hand down. Yeah, sorry, that uh, was left up. All right, so I'm gonna call on uh, Lenore Brick. Uh, you should be able to speak. If, if you would uh, give us your address, Hi. this is the first time you've spoken tonight. Hi, my name is Lenore Brick and I live in Amherst. Um, I, just, I just wanna speak very briefly just to, I mean, there's a lot of things, but just very briefly to the uh, carbon metrics comparing carbon sequestration of a forest to, uh, to solar arrays. Um, it's, it's the wrong question, even though it it's seems so obvious, like that's what we would be looking at. But that kind of reductionist thinking, that's what human beings do to nature's technology because we don't understand the complexity that is a forest. We don't understand the eco services that it provides. We don't understand how it regulates the water cycle. We don't understand um, how it, how um, land with vegetation basically stabilized the climate for millions of years until we deforested the planet, until we started doing what we started doing, because humans have this hubris that we know better than nature. And so even though it seems like a very logical question, it's not, it doesn't cover all of the complexity and the eco services that a forest or any kind of complete ecosystem serves. And, and keep in mind, we don't actually have any more complete ecosystems, or even our forests aren't. But what we have left is so crucial to preserve because climate mitigation, climate resilience, climate adaptation, um, and climate healing cannot happen without preserving as much forest land as we can all over the planet, not just in Amherst. So there, there, this, kind of, um, this kind of mathematics doesn't cover what, let's say, a forest ecologist could explain to us. We, we need solar experts to uh, answer these questions, but we also need forest ecologists and climate um, scientists who understand about the ecology of the planet to give us these answers. And we actually have people in Massachusetts that, that are experts on this, that we can call on, that do understand the complexity of the ecosystem and can answer these questions about solar versus forest, which should not even be you know, this, this forced choice. There's no reason that we can't have both. Um, so I just I just want to make a point that there's some flawed thinking uh, that even the climate movement itself, we, we have taken a lot of the ideology from the climate movement about reducing, you know, fossil fuel emissions and all of that. But even the climate movement itself has been flawed in its strategies until now. It's finally kind of catching up in its strategies and looking at the whole picture. So this is um, it's it's very different when we're talking about 
clear cutting forests for solar. Then we're talking about other kinds of installations. It's very different when we're talking about large industrial solar installations than when we're looking at our past. A lot of your questions here. Uh, all, I, I think the past you, process. It's about three minutes. We don't have the stopwatch going, but it has has been about three minutes. So okay, we can wrap Just, it up. Yes, I'm trying to. So, so I, what I'm saying is you can't, you don't have enough information here to talk about the future implications of these projects from the past experiences that you're, that you're citing. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So question 12, Chris, it sounds like uh, Ben, Ben will be getting us an answer for that. Uh, question 13, how many parcels of land could be affected by the implications of this bylaw and who owns them? That's, That's a another broad, thing that we need. Broad question. Another thing that we need to work on. Um, the answer that we've given here relates to, you know, how much um, solar power could come out of an acre of land, but I think that we need a better answer for that question. So we'll work on that. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, it's clearly. It's not difficult to own an acre of land in Amherst. So, you know, if this turns out to be a list of everybody who owns property in town, you probably don't need to go there. <laughs> uh, question 14. What, if any, effect would the proposed bylaw have on the planned solar farm on Hickory Ridge Golf Course? Doesn't the town's ability to purchase that property depend on being able to build a solar farm on some of that land. Um, the town's goals for that land do uh, include uh, building a solar farm on that land. Um, but what we've determined is that that solar array already has a special permit um, and it is a valid special permit. And the way um, the solar moratorium is presented, it includes uh, an exemption for, for projects that already have a special permit and um, also includes the prospect for extension of or renewal of those existing special permits. So it wouldn't affect the project um, at Hickory Ridge Golf Course. Okay, great. All right, and then question 15. If this moratorium is enacted, it will throw a wet blanket on the development of renewable energy in Amherst exactly at the time when we need it most. Climate models suggest that this is the decade where we have to rapidly decarbonize to stand any chance of stopping the worst impacts of global warming. Sitting out all of 2022 would put Amherst, a leadership community on clean energy, back on its heels with potentially contagious effects in the region. If this bylaw is enacted, what pro-solar policies is the town considering to mitigate the negative effects on solar growth? Some options could include launching a new solarized program to help homeowners install solar, a new community solar program, actually completing the solar project on the new landfill, passing a new building code that mandates solar on all new commercial and residential construction, a plan to install solar on parking lots, brokering an agreement with local colleges and universities to put solar on the built environment, and more. The wet blanket effect seems to already be in action, given that AMP has withdrawn their proposal after the town council voted to continue to pursue the moratorium. Chris? So uh, there was a question in there. Yeah. Uh, so you know, what has there been any discussion that you know of to try to, you know, tout the solar progress that we're been that we are making? I think that's a that is a topic that we need to grab hold of and um, do something about, but we haven't done anything about it yet. Um, and the planning department uh, will be exploring um, answers to that question. But I wanted to uh, say a little bit about AMP. And what we understood um, from AMP when they withdrew their pro proposal was that um, they had questions from the Conservation Commission that they needed to answer. And it would have taken them uh, a, a while to uh, get those answers. It involves um, you know, doing further study of the wetlands that exist on the site, um, potentially doing some soil 
analysis and other things that they couldn't really do in the winter time. So um, they have, have said that even though they've withdrawn, they've withdrawn without prejudice or that's their request. And um, they'll be back, you know, once they have answers to the questions that have been asked by the Conservation Commission and others, they're, they're gonna come back with a refined proposal. So I think it hasn't, um, as far as I know, uh, dampened AMP's enthusiasm to um, install a solar array in Amherst. Um, and as far as the other questions answered, asked here, I think that those are all really good questions. And we have two members of town council here, um, you know, reading these questions, reading these um, suggestions. And so, you know, we can all work together on making some of these things happen. Thank you, Chris. Hey, Jack, I see your hand. Yeah, I was just wanted to say that uh, I'm looking at my rooftop solar. Uh, we. I've generated 73, you know, megawatts uh, over the last five years, and there's no way uh, that you know a little four stand uh, that would replace my house would, I think, uh, compensate for that. And <laughs> um, I feel like we're reinventing the wheel here, but I just, you know, ideally you would want to install solar farms on like brownfields and in that, but we don't have enough brownfields to really, to do that sort of thing. So that's where we're looking at other available properties and things like that. But I really don't think it's, you know, a viable kind of uh, uh, debate with regard to, you know, solar versus, you know, a tree stand because, you know, and additionally, where we need trees, we need, we need wood materials. Uh, you know, we have supply chain uh, issues that everyone is aware of. Um, but again, I, I, I just feel like we're going backwards and we're not like following the science here. Okay. So. Well, I mean, we also have farmland that already has the trees removed. And, you know, if you put a solar farm on that, I know people have been studying whether you can actually grow uh, agricultural crops under solar farms. Um, I gather it's, you know, there's sort yeah. of mixed, mixed reviews. There's some crops that do better and some that don't. Um, but, um, you know, we need food too. Okay, so yeah. uh, I'm gonna, let's go to scroll down to the, the first of the questions that we asked for the, of the proponents, because there was a response from uh, the town staff to this question. Uh, which had to do with what are the deficiencies of the current process to approve large solar arrays in Amherst? And Chris, I don't know if you or uh, Rob would prefer to answer this. Rob started to answer it before, and I think his answer was that our bylaw doesn't have specific criteria and standards for dealing with solar arrays. So there may be things like, you know, Belchertown has a solar bylaw which says, things like the solar array can't be more than 20 acres altogether. And it says you can't clear more than 10 acres of forested land. So there may be things like that that we want to include. I'm not sure what other kinds of things those would be, but um, we don't have those specifically in our um, uh, transformer station or other energy facility or use, although we do, um, abide by you know, the, the stormwater management um, regulations and we reach out to the conservation commission. So we have a whole array of things that we use for all kinds of projects, but we don't have specific standards and criteria for solar arrays. So having a, a solar bylaw would give us the opportunity to put those specifics in the bylaw together. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna interject a sort of a related question that came to, to mind earlier. Um, and Chris and Rob, this is for you. And I understand that you may not want to answer it, but I'm going to just ask, uh, would, you, uh, would you support the town creating a solar bylaw, whether it's under a moratorium period or not? Put that aside. But do you think our current bylaw uh, regulations that apply to solar arrays could be improved by the creation of a solar bylaw. 
I think our regulations could be improved by a solar bylaw. Okay. All right. And Rob, did you want to say anything or not? Uh, I'll just say that I agree with that. Okay. All right. Good. Um, I see Lenore Brick's hand again. Um, is that a legacy hand or do you want to speak again? And if so, uh, you, you will get three minutes. Uh, the hand. Is sorry, sorry, that was, I just, I forgot to put it down. Okay, fine. Thank you. Um, Andrew. Yeah, just, I, I keep a GIS system up during the planning board meeting. So I was just querying some of the stuff from, from the parcels perspective, the one acre, this no suitability at all. This is order of magnitude. There's like 700, 7,300 parcels, 1,200 or more than an acre. 700 or more than an acre with no building on them. And then 200 of those are owned by the town of Amherst. Uh, so just like order of magnitude, like that doesn't even take into account that, you know, some of it's too steep, rocky, all that stuff. So um, there, there are a lot as, as we know. Okay, good. Um, I'm seeing a hand from Anna Gauthier. Thank you. Thanks for um, keeping on calling on me. I appreciate that. I'm waiting till you just decide to cut me off. Um, so really quickly, <laughs> the, uh, I just wanted to note the timing of this because I, I do want to make sure everyone's very aware that this is not a long-term moratorium on solar. We want solar and we know we need large-scale solar. Like It's just the reality, right? We know it's going to happen and we know we need it. Um, developers of solar projects can still start the process prior to submitting a solar application. So what I mean by that is, uh, if you look at the AMP Energy Project, for example, they were before CONCOM in, I think, July or August of 2020 to get that land delineated. It took a long time to get through that process. 18 months is very short. That's what this is, 18 months or less, right? So it's very short amount of time. I don't think that this is actually going to stymie anyone. The, the concern I have personally is, is that folks have the ability to freeze their zoning. And now that they know we're developing a solar bylaw, they can submit a proposal, uh, request to keep continuing it, and then freeze the zoning, right? And so we want to, for me, that's the point, is 18 months is relatively short. Steps can still be taken um, to do things like delineation, to do things like species identification, um, and, and things like that without even submitting their solar plan yet. So I, I would urge you to consider the timing of this. This is not a long-term moratorium by any means. It's very quick. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Lynn, I see your hand. Yeah, um, some of the questions, the way they've been asked tonight, make me still feel that people don't understand that this is not an anti-solar bylaw uh, or proposed bylaw. It's about clear cutting, that's it. I was very involved in a variety of efforts in Amherst that speak to my complete commitment to sustainability and solar. The roof on the Amherst Survival Center, my own personal home, the rewriting of the zero energy bylaw for town buildings. And I just wanna to stick to the last one. That was passed before town meeting was dissolved and we have yet to apply it. And so sometimes we have to just stand back and say, what do we need to do? And if we have one opportunity that happens and it doesn't happen in the right way, then we've made a mistake. So I wanna just make sure we understand this is not an anti-solar bylaw. This is a get it right bylaw. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Uh, Andrew. I will say I for one, Lynn, do not see it as being anti-solar at all. So if that gives you any comfort. Um, to me, it's, it's, you know, the issue remains like, are we able to, under our current zoning, put in enough protections for the town that we feel comfortable about? And I think I will just say what I've been hearing right now is very much yes. Um, I agree with, with Chris, Doug's question. I agree with Chris that 
uh, we do need to have a provision, but I don't think this is necessarily an either or. I think that we can continue to manage proposals as they come in as we're developing a bylaw. And I think that, you know, from what we've seen of these examples, we do seem to have some really uh, strong protections that we could put in place to, to keep the town's interests uh, at heart. Thanks. Right. Thank you, Andrew. Tom? Sure, thanks. Lynn, I, I just wanted to clarify that I, I appreciate your sentiment, um, but this is not about clear cutting because this is about solar, because the bylaw made it about solar and not about clear cutting. So if we had a moratorium on clear cutting in front of us that was talking about issues about deforestation, we'd be looking at a completely different bylaw than the one that was presented to us. So I just want to be clear that the way that it is framed and that pe why people see it as anti-solar, um, I'm not saying I necessarily say that, but um, but I think that people see that because of the language you just used, which is, hey, this is about clear cutting, but it's not. The, the bylaw doesn't talk about, isn't focused on clear cutting. It isn't focused on deforestation per se. It's focused on a particular issue of putting in solar arrays. Um, and that is the focus of this, this moratorium on stopping solar being built out for 18 months when there's a very short period of time to turn around um, our environmental, um, um, our poor environmental contributions. Thank you, Tom. That, that was the, the, the objective with that earlier question about uh, just you know, can landowners clear cut their land? Um, and the answer seems to be yes. So, uh, you know, this moratorium would not affect that. So uh, I see your hand, Pat. Um, and um, you can go ahead and unmute or mute, you know, unmute yourself. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it can be difficult to disagree with a colleague. It is not about, I agree with Tom, it's not about clear cutting. There is in the, uh, the site on Chutes Ray Road, there would be clear cutting of 45 acres of mature forest. That's an issue. But the bylaw is going to be addressing uh, mitigation. It's going to be addressing the kind of fencing, whether or not animals are going to be able to get under the fencing. It's going to talk about um, size. And it, I've been telling people over and over again who are totally anti this project that I'm not doing that. I'm trying to set a size that makes sense that we can balance the intricacies of what a forest system gives us with the need for electricity. So, you know, I don't want 45 acres clear cut, but I want there to be um, a balance. So maybe a four to one balance. So if there are 20 acres, then there needs to be another 80 acres that are open. Um, so anyway, Tom, thank you for bringing that point up because this is a solar bylaw. It is not about clear cutting alone, it is not. Thank you, Pat. All right, the time is 8.38 and we've missed our usual eight o'clock time for, for a break. Um, I'm, I guess I'm feeling like uh, maybe it would be smart for us to continue this hearing to the, to the next meeting. Um, but I, you know, if people wanna just decide this this evening, I'm not gonna stand in the way. So uh, board members, uh, has anybody got any feelings about whether they'd like to keep talking about this this evening or, or think about it for a couple of weeks? Uh, Maria. Um, I wouldn't mind postponing it uh, or continuing it because there were some staff questions and sort of some uh, questions I had that weren't answered and it'd be nice to have that information to build on because um, the answers that we did get, boy, I, I learned a lot and, you know, I, this is not my field. So it'd be great to get a little bit more information. Um, yeah. That's it. Thank you. Jack? Yeah, I just, I, I want to say that, you know, I have complete confidence in, in the, you know, our zoning board of appeals 
and the process that they have gone through, the vetting of the existing projects. And I think a moratorium is always a bad look for, you know, local, you know, town of Amherst economy. I, I just, I'm just, I just, it just doesn't fly with me. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's where I'm, that's, you know, where I'm at, you know, cause I, I do agree that we should have a bylaw and, you know, down, you know, I'm down with that, but I'm just a moratorium, just, it, it, it's just off-putting to me. So it doesn't really matter to you whether we decide tonight or in two weeks, you've pretty much, you know where you stand. Correct. All right, thank you. Andrew. Thanks, Doug. I, I agree with Maria. I think there's some outstanding questions, which it would, I, I think it would be useful to get answers to. I, I was curious for the sponsors, um, you know, Pat and Lynn, having heard some of the answers to these questions, is that, does it change your opinion about um, whether we need to, and I understand you, you probably wouldn't feel comfortable maybe uh, answering that directly now, but I guess I, it's something I would ask you to, uh, to consider. Maybe you already knew the answers to all these questions, but, but having heard them, you know, perhaps, perhaps you have a different perspective now. So I'll okay. just leave it as an open-ended comment. Thanks. Right. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Pam, I'm going to ask you, you, I don't think we need to be sharing screen anymore. I think we're done with these questions. Thank you. Okay, so uh, would anybody like to move that we continue this hearing to December 15th? Um, I think we had, a, we, we already have a topic for 645. Um, what time would you suggest, Chris? I would suggest seven. You have two public hearings. You have one for 635, one for 645. So you could make this one for seven. Thank you. All right, uh, Tom. So move. And Andrew? Second. All right. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll do a roll call. Maria? Approve. Jack? Aye. Tom? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Johanna? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. So the time is 8.42. Uh, do people want to take a five minute break? We'll come back at 8.47. I'm seeing a few expressions of positive support for that. So put, turn off your cameras, make sure you're muted, and we'll see you back at 847.
All right, it's 8.47, at least on my clock. Okay, looks like most of us are back. And there's Johanna. <laughs> All right, so the time, at least on my clock, says 8.49. And we're now up to item five in the agenda, which is old business. Site plan review 2022-06 with Christine Lindstrom. 534 Main Street. Uh, Chris, uh, do you know who will be presenting this this evening? I think I will be presenting it. I don't see Christine Lindstrom in the audience. Um, yeah. But uh, essentially it was um, that she came before you for site plan review for her mixed use building and her uh, special permit for a parking lot across the street at 534 Main Street, and this was a few weeks ago. And you um, imposed a condition that she should come back with the designs for her signs. So she's come back to show you, um, I think the first in your packet is Feather Press Studio. It's a, and maybe Pam could show these on the, uh, yeah, on the screen. Um, Feather Press Studio and Archival Matters are two, um, long rectangular signs that are going to be put up on the side of the building. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a, we didn't include an image of that side of the building, but I think you will remember that there were two blank sign frames on the, I guess it's the west side of the um, commercial portion of the building. And so Christine Lindstrom proposes to put this sign in one of those spaces. And then if, if Pam can scroll down to the, the third sign in this, um, not that one, but the next one, yep, Archival Matters. Those are the two signs that are gonna go into those existing um, rectangular spaces. And, so that's, then, and that's the side of the building that faces High Street? That faces High Street, that's correct. Okay. And then she has, um, a sign for fitness together, which is the middle sign in this um, array of signs. So if Pam can scroll up a bit. Um, so the middle sign is fitness together and that's going to replace the Valley Framework sign, which is over that door. And so that's the plan for the signs. So Christine would be looking for you to um, approve these signs so that she can uh, get them installed. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Chris. Andrew. Thanks, Doug. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't really have any problems with these signs, although I guess one thing I'm, I'm noticing, I, none of them are illuminated, right? There's no, like, I don't see any goosenecks here, and, and this one at least says it's going to be aluminum. So, like, these, these won't be backlit signs or anything like that. No. These are just no. freestanding painted signs. Very good. Thanks. Any other comment from the board. All right, and I don't see any public hands raised. So uh, I assume we need to vote on this. So we'll do a roll call, uh, unless anybody has any more comment. You wanna have someone mo make a motion? Yes, that would be a good idea. Thank you, Chris. All right, Andrew. I'll, I'll make a motion. 
to uh, to approve the signs as presented here. Thank you, and Johanna. I'll second Johanna? Andrew's motion. Oh, good. Thank you. All right. Uh, no further discussion. I don't see any hands. Uh, we'll we'll take a roll call. Maria. Approved. And Jack. Aye. Tom. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Johanna. Aye. And I'm an aye as well. That's unanimous. All right, the time is 8.53 and we've concluded item four. We'll go to item, I'm sorry, item five and we'll go to item six on the agenda, new business. Topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours prior to the meeting. Uh, Chris or Pam, do we have any new business of that type? We have no new business. All right, how about uh, form A, a and R subdivision applications? We don't have one tonight, but you will have one um, next time you meet. You'll have both an ANR and a site and a subdivision. The ANR has to do with um, Ares College land on the west side of South Pleasant Street, um, where they're going to be constructing a new building at 197 South Pleasant Street. So you'll see the ANR first, and then you'll see a site plan review come in probably in January. Um, and is, then that, the, uh, is that the building that we received a briefing on from Amherst College earlier? I think so. Yes, that's right. Yep, we did. It was an addition to a uh, historic house? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Okay. So that will be coming to you. And then what was the other thing? Um, SUB applications. So um, I think I've already oh, we're not, told we're you We're not that. there yet. Oh, sorry. Uh, now we now we do ZBA applications. Nothing new tonight. All right. Now, Chris, now we're ready for S, SP, SBR, and SUB applications. So um, this the SUB application that we have that's new is John Robleski wanting to freeze the zoning on his properties at 446 and 462 Main Street. Um, it's where he, he's got the uh, the building that used to be owned by Jerry Gadera and also um, his uh, property that he's owned for quite a while where he recently um, removed the house, the old house. Um, so in order to not have to comply with the mixed use building bylaw, which he's concerned about, um, he's, he's concerned about the, the, the house that's at the corner of Great, I guess it's, is that's it Gray, Gray Street. Street. Yes, it's yeah. Gray Street, Gray Street and Main Street. So that um, house that exists there, he's concerned about having to have 30% mixed use on the bottom uh, floor. And he's concerned about having two frontages. And he just doesn't know how this mixed use building bylaw is going to affect his ability to um, develop that property. So anyway, he's filed a, a preliminary subdivision plan, um, which you will be seeing on when will you be seeing? 15th. I think December fifteenth. Yes, that's right, on the fifteenth. Um, so that's one thing. In addition to that, we've received, and I may have told you about this last time, a site plan review application for the Wagner Farm on the east side of Northeast Street. Um, the Wagner Farm is where they they do a lot of um, creating. Um, what do you call it? Uh, mulch, wood, mulch. Wood, chips, wood chips and mulch. And that's, yeah. that's at the eastern end of Strong Street. That's where right. It ends, yes. Ends yes. Southeast Street or Northeast. They, Northeast. Yeah. Street. And they also have cattle there. So what they want to do, and I, I imagine that they also have other things that they grow there. But their goal is to have a new um, small building that they would um, use as a farm stand, and I believe it's a Class One farm stand. So they're planning to sell meat that they grow on their property and butcher on their property and um, sell meat there and other things that they grow. Um, so you'll be seeing that as a site plan review application. And I think that's coming before you on January 5th. And I, um, let's see, there's one other thing that, the other thing is escaping me right now, but I'll tell you about it next time. <clears throat> All right. Uh, planning board committee and liaison reports. 
what do we have? Uh, let's see, Jack, do you want to go first? Um, yep. Uh, Pine Air uh, Valley Planning Commission uh, has no, no, no info. Um, I think we met a few weeks ago, but nothing really to report. Hey, I would like to say that, hey, I, I signed up for the Chamber of Commerce uh, next Tuesday. I don't know where, oh, Savannah's on University Drive. So uh, hopefully anyone, uh, you know, hopefully I see some of you there. That'll be fun. That's, that's their, their holiday party. So oh, okay. I, I've been kind of remiss in terms of doing that kind of stuff. So maybe a few of you can make it. All right, thanks for the uh, news. Thanks for the reminder. Um, C CPAC, Andrew. Thanks, Doug. First, Jack, what was the date of the event? It's next uh, Tuesday. Tuesday, okay. Cool. Yeah, it's Savannah. That's a, that's a noon meeting? No, no, no. It's like a, it's a happy hour sort of thing. Five, five to seven. It's a holiday party for, for the chamber. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Um, CPAC, we're, uh, we're right in the thick of our deliberations. We've had our presentations for the 18 proposals. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of proposals. It's more money than we currently have. Um, so we are, you know, we've, we've begun by just focusing on some of the large projects and having conversations around those. We'll be hitting the recreation ones. Uh, tomorrow night, I think the recreation and some of the history. Well, you know, it's actually not even quite like that. It's the smaller, the smaller budget items. We'll talk more about tomorrow. But um, lots of great projects. I mean, I think like we can't really go wrong. I think, um, but uh, there are some tough decisions we'll need to make. Okay. Uh, design review, Tom. No updates. We have a meeting in a couple of weeks. Okay. And then uh, Chris, CRC. CRC um, has met, I think I've met with you recently since then, but in, in any event, they have recommended um, all the four zoning amendments that went before the town council the other night, which were the um, Article 14 temporary zoning extension to allow building commissioner to grant permission for certain things to happen because of the COVID-19 emergency. Um, so they recommended that. They recommended um, the mixed use buildings. They recommended the um, parking. parking facility CVS lot. Uh, district on the CVS lot. And they recommended, they didn't recommend, yes, they did. They did recommend the parking article seven um, article as well. And those things went before the uh, town council on Monday and town council will be um, deliberating about those this coming Monday, December 6th. Uh, it's possible that they may not vote on the article seven parking um, proposal on that night because Maureen uh, was kind of squeezed at the end of the meeting and didn't have an opportunity to really give a full presentation about, um, about that article seven. Um, so, but they will, they do plan to vote on the other three. All right. Thank you. All right. Report of the chair. Um, tonight I do have something to talk about and that is our planning reports that go to town council. Um, you all may probably saw the emails last week from Chris with her drafts of the reports for each of those bylaw amendments. And, um, one member of our board in particular was quite upset about the pace of issuing those and the short period for their review. And in fact, made a point of attending the town council meeting on Monday and, and making a statement about how uh, egregious the process was in terms of meeting state requirements. So I have I talked to Chris earlier today about her experience with these reports. She indicated that they are custom, they have customarily been written by staff and that um, in the past, previous planning directors have submitted them to 
uh, you know, either the select board or town meeting or whatever the uh, legislative body was um, prior to any planning board meeting happening. Um, and they, that they usually did ask the chair to uh, review them before they went out if the time was short. Um, now we did send these to you all uh, over the last week or so and have not, other than one member, it, haven't gotten any response from any of you. Um, one of the complaints that was made was that the planning board should have to vote and formally approve these reports before they go to town council. And uh, clearly that has not been Chris's experience and the practice of this town. Um, Chris did find the section of the uh, Mass General Law that talks about the requirement for the report. And the, the, the text of the language does not say the board needs to formally approve it. It simply says a report needs to come to town council with uh, information essentially on how the planning board voted on it. So we think we have met the requirements of uh, state law. Um, I, I know Chris and you know staff regret that time was short. Um, the deadline was sooner than I think she anticipated. And uh, we're certainly gonna work hard to avoid the scramble to get those done in the future. But I wanted to publicly say that. So sorry you guys had to listen to it if you didn't really wanna hear it. But uh, you know, I hope that goes in the minutes and it'll be in the recording. Um, but I do want to ask you all, you know, do you, I mean, do you feel that we were remiss or are you dissatisfied with how we handled that um, with the understanding that we don't plan to try to let that happen again? But, uh, you know, are you comfortable with the way we're doing this and that Chris basically is writing these reports um, unless one of you want to volunteer to write it? Uh, you know, we're going to continue to ask Chris to do that. And that it's not really necessary for us to formally vote on these uh, or have extensive review discussions about them prior to them going to town council. Um, so uh, I just wanted to raise that subject. And I see Jack uh, and I see Andrew. So Jack, why don't you go up first? Yeah, I'm volunteering to uh, to write these reports, but you, you won't get them until like 2023, if that's okay. <laughs> right, after, <laughs> right, right after your right after the minutes, right? <laughs> but anyway, all I want to say is like, I, I guess if we're doing these reports, let's have the minutes that that parallel them. I think, and then that'll take care of everything. You know. Yeah, I, I guess one of the things that you know, if you looked at the reports, you'll see first of all that they were very long. And second of all, that a great deal of the material in them was a recap of the meeting discussions that is essentially what's in the minutes. Yeah. So I do plan to talk to Lynn Griesmer and about what town council really wants from us. Um, I think we could substantially shorten the report itself and then just attach the minutes of every meeting where we talked about that topic. And um, my hope is that that will somewhat reduce the burden on staff to be generating reports. I mean, you know, between minutes and reports, I can't imagine that Chris or Pam get a whole lot else done, but I know they've got a lot of other responsibilities. So yeah, yeah, it seems to me like the reports are like even more important than the minutes. And we've already, you know, had all this kind of scrutiny about our minutes, well, mainly, gonna, mainly, you know, the scheduling and timing, but, uh, but also yeah, that's going to continue, you know, we've got to keep yeah. up with the minutes. Yeah. Um, but, and um, I'll, I'll come back to minutes, but let's, let's finish this topic. Andrew. Thanks, Doug. <clears throat> to me, yeah, I think, I mean, to me, like the issue is just sort of calendar man management. It's like, I get it that there was a lot that was happening, you know, it felt like we've all year 
like we were presented with things we needed to talk about somehow, at least to me, it felt like we were always working on everything at once, like all year long. And I know that's not, that's not how everybody feels about it, but uh, from my perspective, like the time management made this feel more uncomfortable than it should be. I think like the actual steps of the mechanics of, of what's produced. I don't have an issue with that. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not, I'm not like a professional writer. I, I don't think I could add any value uh, to, to how those are created. And I certainly trust the team to be able to do that. But I think to the extent that we can manage the flow of, of the calendar so that, I mean, honestly, to me, start with one thing, get it done. Start with something else, get it done. Not keep four things going at once because you just, you can't function. Like brains don't, aren't designed to function like that. So I'd love, I'd love to see if we can, move to that space and hopefully that would alleviate some of this concern that everything's coming to a head at once. Thanks. Right. Okay, good. Any other comments about that? All right, so as, oh, Maria. Oh, real quick. Uh, yeah, just thinking back over the years, maybe Jackie remember, I don't remember ever voting on a report. In fact, I kind of remember Steve sort of saying Chris sent them to me and I looked it over it looks fine like when we're getting ready for town meeting so I saw Janet's email but I didn't have time to read through the whole thing but I just thought I kind of scratched my head like what what vote I couldn't remember doing that ever but um I honestly did not read the reports because I figured they were just summaries of the months and months of discussions we had and it was not going to be any new information so it wasn't really something that I felt like you know I wasn't trusting the planning staff to, you know, handle just as well as, you know, the way they do minutes very thoroughly and way too long. But, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I completely trust them and didn't even uh, attempt to read them, I have to say, because I think they were just literally summaries of what we'd already done. But as far as the process moving forward, um, yes, it's been fast paced, but I'm actually very thankful for how proactive we've been because we had been sort of twiddling our thumbs for like three years. Well, I mean, not three years, it's an exaggeration. A year where a town council was like coming into like understanding what was going on with all, all, the, all the things they had to deal with. And so the zoning subcommittee and planning board literally like we were just sort of waiting and waiting. And so when it all came to a head, it was... <laughs> It was pretty overwhelming, but I, I honestly, I was really thankful for it because finally something was happening and um, yeah, it was a little hectic, but um, we have four really great article amendments come out of it so far. And um, uh, I don't want to spend many, many meetings discussing process. I've been through all those kind of corporate workshops where we're like trying to figure out how to be more efficient by taking a whole day off to do that and it drives me nuts. So I, I, I'd love to find out a process, but if there's a way we don't have like meeting after meeting about how to have meetings, that would be fantastic. <laughs> That's right, Maria. Two cents. Thank you, Johanna. Um, I read the reports, Chris, and I too, I feel like they're a you know synopsis and I have no problem with the kind of quality or you know like they they're just a recap of the work that we've done and they've always been accurate so I don't feel a need to vote on them um and then I love Doug's idea of figuring out how can we make them even more concise given that they are you know it seems like you lean on the minutes already so hopefully that's helpful but I think you know we could make that even tighter okay good Jack yeah, I just want to uh, concur, you know, with, with Maria that we have not, you know, in the last five years, you know, looked at these things with the scrutiny of, uh, you know, with regard to the minutes. But, you know, I think in, in uh, you know, standard practice, it'd be good to have the minutes accompany them. And that just, you know, makes more sense there. But again, I think, you know, we have been very, you know, Amherst is blessed because the planning department has so much expertise and, and all that. And, and, and we've been relying on them for what? hundred years, 200 years, uh, no. <laughs> a long time. But I mean, it, it's not like we don't have it, a competent staff and, 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 you know, that requires a scrutiny of, of things. Right. So just, 
you know, um, and that's and that's why again, you know, like Marie said, we hadn't really looked at these things in my memory of being on the board for five years. So, okay, all right. Yeah. Well, um, so I think we will continue to have you know Chris draft them. We will we will think some and talk some about the format, and then. Um, you know, we will try to manage the calendar so that they are done in more time for people to look at at a little more leisure. But, uh, you know, if time is short, um, we're going to produce them uh, and meet the, the expectations of the town council for their schedule. And uh, there may be times where we are at their mercy. All right, then the other thing I wanted to come back to was our, our minutes. And I know we've, you know, it's too bad that Janet's not with us because I know she's, this has been a topic of particular interest to her. Um, but I have asked Chris uh, to follow up on something I mentioned, I think in the last meeting, which was uh, to maybe send us some examples of minutes from a couple of surrounding towns. You know, I took some time and looked at Northampton's planning board minutes. Um, you know, they had three hour meetings and five pages of minutes. Um, you know, so I think we could learn from them. And, and then I also asked if she could uh, pull out some minutes from say five or 10 years ago that might uh, show us that it's Sometimes it used to be different in Amherst. Um, and so, you know, I'm hoping, I, I guess the other thing that I'm, I'm thinking that is that I'm gonna probably be a little less willing to support edits from planning board members, um, just sort of as, as a matter of course, because I'd like to trust the expertise of our staff and not have them gun shy that they are gonna get second guests by the planning board when they produce minutes. So, um, you know, if there's something egregious that's left out, you know, you know an hour of a meeting is not mentioned, um, sure. But uh, I, I think we need to give them a little more rain to use a metaphor and, um, let them do what they think is necessary. And, you know, if somebody tells us it's not legal, then we, we can make adjustments. But um, until we've got some serious problems, I think we should let them do it, do what they do best. And, and like you said, Jack, we are blessed, not only with their expertise, but having them at all. There are plenty of towns that don't have a planning staff at all. And, Planning board members take all the minutes, write all the reports, and um, we are fortunate in that respect. Or maybe we're not. Maybe if we didn't have the planning board doing all that work, we'd have a little more pushback on excessive minutes and, and reports. So um, I've said my piece. That's that's my report for tonight. Um, the time is 9.16. Uh, Chris, do you have a report of staff? Uh, my only report is this has been a heck of a year and thank you very much for all your work and I'm hoping that next year is a little bit easier and I've already put a bug in Dave Zomek's ear that um, maybe we could back off a little bit and not have meetings as often as we've had them. So I'm hoping for that. All right, good. Okay. All right, so the time is 9.16, maybe 9.17 and uh... Unless anybody has anything else to say, I think we can adjourn. Good night. Thank Thanks you, everybody. All else. We'll see you in two weeks. Bye. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Two weeks. Thanks, Doug. Bye. Good night. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.